Good morning and aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. And today we are going to talk about investments coming from Japan, the history, a brief history, uh, if there is such a thing, of Japanese investment in the United States and in Hawaii. And my guest, very knowledgeable attorney, uh, Alan F Fujimoto, a good friend of mine who I've known for many, many years. Uh, he was born and raised in Japan, speaks Japanese fluently, and in his practice has had a lot of experience helping Japanese investors in the United States make investments, work through them, work out of them. Uh, and I've asked him to come today to talk a little bit about his own experience, his own background, uh, and also his experience with Japanese investment in the United States and especially in Hawaii, so that we can get a, 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 a basic understanding of what, what happened in the past. Alan, welcome. It's very good to see you. Uh, good to be here, Mark. Good to always be with you uh, and talk a little bit. And uh, Alan and I have talked for years about things Japanese and Japanese investment. Alan, you were born in Japan, raised there. How did you get here? How did you get to Hawaii? Yeah. Well, first, uh, my father is originally from Hawaii. Uh, he was in the 442nd uh, in Italy, and after that, he joined the uh, Army uh, Civil Service and was stationed in Japan, where he met my mother, a Japanese. Uh, and I was born and raised in Japan, uh, but I did attend international schools and uh, the Department of Defense uh, High School on the basis there. So uh, my primary language is English. I picked up the Japanese on my own, uh, of course, to be able to communicate with my mother and my Japanese friends out there and to reading and writing to uh, read the Japanese comic books and the newspapers. So. <laughs> So that's how I became uh, fluent in Japanese. I see. Okay. And, and I know from my own experience, knowing you all, all these years, uh, that you've been very involved in Japanese investment. And, but how, how did you get to, to be involved here in Hawaii as a lawyer? How did that, that come um, about? Okay. Well, after graduating from high school in uh, Japan, uh, I came here to attend the university, um, and after that I went to law school in California, and even while I was at law school, my thinking was uh, it's best for me to be able to utilize the uh, Japanese language ability that I have and to deal uh, with the uh, Japanese investors coming into Hawaii. Uh, so that's where my primary interest was. And after graduating from law school uh, from UC Davis, I came back to Hawaii. Um, I, well, actually, I clerked at the Hawaii Supreme Court for one year with Justice Yoshimi Hayashi, but I already had lined up a job with a very small firm called Kashiwa Kashiwa and Kato. Yeah, I, I, know, uh, I, I knew them well. Yeah, uh, and, and Kenro Kashiwa, uh, the founder of that firm, was uh, a uh, go-getter in terms of the Japanese, early Japanese investors. Uh, and they had a good range of Japanese clientele, so I, I thought it was a perfect fit for me, so I joined the firm. And then, uh, a couple weeks after I joined the firm, uh, the partners uh, there told me, okay, we're going to be merging with Goodsell. So I was with the Kashiwa firm for all of five or six months and uh, I joined Goodsill back in 85 and I've been with Goodsill since. Okay, all right. Well, uh, you know, your dad being with 442nd, uh, I mean, that could be a, uh, another program. Oh, I mean, that, uh, absolutely. That, especially <laughs> in Italy and the Lost Battalion and that, that whole story is quite, quite remarkable. So uh, he went to uh, Japan. And, and, and then that's where you grew up, but you learned the background and the culture there and came here and joined a law firm. And uh, obviously the Kashiwa firm, very well known in those days for early investment. Now, what, tell us about the early investment. What, what, what was that? I mean, who, what was happening with, with Japanese? I mean, we, we know that 
uh, Admiral Matthew Perry went <laughs> went to Japan and That's said, we want, <laughs> we want trade with you. That was uh, 160 years ago or so. And, and, and he wanted to open up the U.S. and Japan to trade. Well, so well, what happened? Uh, and well, it's not too far-fetched to talk about <laughs> Admiral Perry, because actually the Japanese uh, from way back when have always been enterprising and looking for um, places where they can uh, invest uh, beyond the confines of the Japanese islands. So uh, even back then, they were looking to Korea, China, and elsewhere. But in the uh, period right after World War II, uh, the Japanese economy, of course, was in tatters, and they were trying to rebuild. And uh, in the mid-50s, I believe it was, uh, things started uh, moving forward. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, that's exactly when the airline industry started to take off. Uh, and Japan uh, came up with a uh, semi-government entity. And Japan Airlines was a semi-government uh, uh, entity at the time, and they started developing overseas routes. Uh, and uh, tourism outside of Japan became a reality, and Hawaii was actually a, a very favorite destination. I remember when growing up in Japan, I watched the Japanese quiz programs, and the big prize would be uh, a trip to Hawaii. Yeah, I remember seeing that. So uh, tourism was growing, and Japanese uh, started going overseas. Uh, a lot of them came to Hawaii. And once the visitors start moving, then all the business people notice that took, and, took say, notice, yeah. and say, well, maybe there's some business opportunity here. So. Uh, it took a while uh, for that industry to grow, but then in the early 60s, uh, there were some enterprising business people who took advantage and said, well, this is an opportunity. Maybe we should look into this and uh, started investing in Hawaii. And one of the earliest was, uh, you probably know Kenji Osano, right. uh, who was the owner of Kokusai Kogyo in Japan. And they were in the tourism, transportation, uh, and other uh, real estate and other businesses in Japan and said, okay. And he, I uh, understand he initially purchased the Princess Kaiolani Hotel. And, Here in and, Hawaii? Yes. Yeah, 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 and yeah, went on to acquire the Moana Surfrider, the Royal Hawaiian Sheraton Waikiki, and the um, Sheraton Maui. And he had the foresight to uh, take advantage of the growing tourism industry where the Japanese were coming to Hawaii. That was really the start of the most, uh, uh, I guess, post-war uh, uh, investment of the Japanese into Hawaii. And, and Kenji Osano, the name's well known to us in Hawaii because we've heard it. Was he making investments only in Hawaii or was he making investments in the, uh, the mainland United States? And, and where was he getting his money? And, and, and it, it was, how was the reaction to him? Uh, we're just a little bit past World War II uh, and now we have Japanese coming into the United States and making investment. What, what, what do you know about that background? Uh, okay, well, I wasn't around, so I can't really be sure how, what the reaction might have been, but, but Kenji Osano was not looking only at Hawaii. He did, in fact, uh, after Hawaii, uh, also did invest in San Francisco with the Palace Hotel and also in Florida. So uh, he wasn't looking only at Hawaii. Uh, and uh, Kenji Osano's business, uh, as I said, was in the travel transportation business in Japan. And uh, with the uh, growing income of the uh, Japanese in the 50s and 60s, um, people started spending more money on uh, travel and transportation and so forth. And uh, he did make a lot of money there, which uh, he did. Uh, invest overseas. Well, one thing about the Japanese is that once they uh, start to realize that there may be limitations to what they can do in Japan, they do start looking overseas. That's been a characteristic of them over the years, and uh, Osano had the foresight to uh, look to Hawaii and elsewhere. So, he, and he was developing his, his own business in Japan, 
and that's where he made his money, I, I guess. Did, 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 he, did he have to borrow money, or did he, I mean, did he, did he make this investment with his savings, or how, how, how did he go out there and, and, start, and start buying hotels, yeah, which uh, cost substantial amounts of, of, of dollars? Course, of course there was borrowing, too, but uh, the reality of it is also that the uh, getting money out of Japan uh, initially was very difficult, uh, as it is currently for China and Korea. Uh, when uh, a country is redeveloping, the government doesn't want the money uh, sourced outside uh, of the country. They, they want the investment to be in the country so the country can continue, continue to prosper and develop. But um, Kenji Osano somehow managed to get the banks involved and uh, of course, with his cash as well, he managed to get the funds to invest overseas. And he, so he found a way. He yeah. found a way to do it because he could see that this was a good investment. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what, 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 what was the result of his investments? How, what, where, where, where did they go and what, what, what happened to Kenji um, Osano? Well, Kenji Osano, you may know, uh, was involved in a... Uh, bribery scandal later on uh, back in the late 80s as I recall uh, with one of the uh, principles of the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, uh, a, a legislator um, uh, that was pretty powerful and they uh, both of them uh, got indicted by uh, the Japan authorities and uh, they ended up with a lot of problems. But the investments did well, and the Kokusai Kogyo people, uh, after some bumps along the way, still own um, most of the properties uh, that they acquired, uh, at least all of the properties in Hawaii that they acquired, uh, and they're doing well. And of course, the initial investment by Osano spurred other investors uh, to come to Hawaii after that. So like, like who else was coming? And, uh, of uh, course, uh, with the travel industry, you had uh, people like uh, JTB, JALPAC, the travel agencies coming into Hawaii, uh, the wedding uh, uh, industry. Yes. We see people. them downtown yes. all um, the time now, yeah. yeah. Like uh, Watabe came in uh, the 70s, JTB and those other folks came in the 70s. Uh, so that spurred quite a bit of um, investment from Japan uh, in the 70s. And, and uh, th this is not just Hawaii, this is mainland United States too, or is it mostly Hawaii that we're seeing it? Or? Um, initially, uh, for the 70s, I, I think um, much of it was in Hawaii. I don't recall that there was much uh, interest at that time in, on, on the mainland at the time. So. Uh, initially, it was primarily in Hawaii. Okay, and that was that was in in the, in the 60s and 70s when that started happening, and uh, a, a lot of it had to do with uh, sort of a Japanese affinity for Hawaii too. Absolutely. What's that about? I mean, I mean, I see it, and uh, I, the Japanese seem to love Hawaii. They do. <laughs> and and uh, I, is it a cultural? Uh, Thing because we've had so many uh, so much Japanese influence here, or what, what, what do you think that is that that, that br brings? I mean, it brings people, which investment then follows. So what, what's that formula? Um, part of it may have to do with the fact that uh, there is a large Japanese American population here, and when you go to stores in Waikiki, you have these employees who speak Japanese, and it's not like it started. Uh, recently, uh, even back in the 60s and 70s, we had uh, people who were, uh, well, if not fluent, at least can speak some Japanese and uh, deal with the Japanese uh, tourists. So I'm sure that had something to do with that. So there's sort of a receptive climate here, a friendliness in, in Hawaii uh, that brought money. I mean, the, the two things are interconnected. Although you yeah. don't, you don't always think mm -hmm. that's the way it should be. Uh, and and the mainland United States kind of followed after that. Is is 
Is that correct? Yeah, the mainland was a little after that. Um, uh, I don't know if you wanted to start talking about the bubble yet. But well, <laughs> we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. Because we're going to take a break right okay, now. Okay, sure. And then we'll get back and talk about when you actually started into practice and what happened. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope. Make this world a little better. Take it to bed, so try a little more. We are back with Alan Fujimoto talking about a brief history of Japanese investment in the United States, especially with respect to Hawaii. And uh, Alan, you, you became a lawyer in uh, 1985, I believe. And, and that was about the time of what they call the, the Japanese bubble, isn't that right? What, what, what was that? Tell, tell us about that. Um, okay, officially I did a little checking and the official records say that the Japanese bubble period was between 1986 and 1992. Okay. Uh, what led to that basically uh, before that was that uh, the real estate prices in Japan started jumping in the mid uh, or the early to mid 80s and land prices became really exorbitant in Japan particularly in the uh, metropolitan areas and people Tokyo, could, Osaka, Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, mm -hmm. places like that and people could not afford uh, real property. Uh, at the same time, the uh, restrictions on the yen uh, were lifted by the Japanese government. So what uh, back in the early 80s was uh, 240 yen to the dollar started going up. So then in the mid 80s it was already down to like 130 yen to the dollar. Um, so the yen is becoming more valuable. Yes. So um, it's probably a combination of things like that, but uh, the Japanese uh, looked at it and said, hey, we can't afford these high prices for Japanese property. What about overseas? And sure enough, uh, land prices uh, were pretty stable at the time in the US, uh, and uh, people noticed that. and started looking into the USS possibilities and the bank, the amazing thing about the banks at this time was that uh, the properties that these companies owned in Japan were valued so high uh, that a lot of the banks said, well, we'll just keep the Japanese property as collateral. Uh, the value is so high. Why don't you borrow our money based on the collateral in Japan and you can buy properties in the US and we won't even mortgage those US properties. Wow. The Japanese properties should be fine. Crazy when you think about it. When you but, think back, yes. Yeah. But, Hindsight. Uh, those, 2020. those are the things they were doing. So there was plenty of money available from the banks. Hmm. So why wouldn't these companies interested uh, look for properties in the US. They couldn't afford more properties in Japan because they were so expensive, but there were cheap properties available in the US. So that's how they ended up coming to Hawaii. Uh, a lot of companies you'd never heard of before uh, started coming to Hawaii, buying up hotels, um, office properties, golf courses, resorts, and this wasn't restricted to Hawaii. It went all the way to the mainland and 
Uh, you might remember uh, the resentment people had when the Japanese bought out Rockefeller Center in oh, New okay. York. And yes, I remember <laughs> that very distinctly. So mm -hmm. yeah, t tell, tell us a little bit about that and what, what your thoughts are about that, too. Um, well, I mean, they had the money. The banks were willing to uh, lend them the money. Uh, so uh, these companies that never invested in the U.S. had all this money to spend. And uh, people were buying up properties in Hawaii. They said, okay, well, I'll move on to Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago. Well, New York's available too, why not? So they bought out these prime uh, office buildings in New York as well. And um, they had the money, they thought nothing of it. And uh, they ended up as landowners uh, in the United States. And, and uh, a lot of the, the funds were for loans that were based on mortgages on the Japan property, yes. not necessarily the uh, United States property, right. a, a, as I understand it. And uh, did anybody think about that at the time? Or, I mean, did, did, they, they didn't call it the bubble at no, that period. No. What, what were they thinking? I, I guess they, they didn't think. They just no, no, figured I, they, they I, had apparently money. Apparently not, yeah. Uh, and the, the, all these circumstances with the yen becoming more valuable uh, kind of coalesced. Mm -hmm. What happened? What happened? Of course, I mean, this wouldn't last. Uh, the, what happened was the property values in Japan started to go down. Then the banks started saying, whoops. Well, I mean, we're covering all of these acquisitions in the U.S. based on the real property values in Japan. If these values in Japan drop, that might be a problem. And sure enough, it was. Uh, and uh, the loans started going bad. Uh, primarily back in the early 90s, I guess, people started realizing uh, this effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the banks were in trouble. And they had to figure out, well, what should we do about this situation? And what, what did they do? And also, during this period of time, what were you doing? <laughs> I, by, by the way, what, what, what was your role as a Japanese-speaking attorney in Hawaii, American attorney who knew the customs and practices of Japan? What was your role? Oh, uh, the, the interesting way? thing uh, is that I mentioned that I started practicing in 85 just as the bubble was starting. Uh, so it kept me very busy, uh, kept a lot of attorneys busy in Hawaii and across the U.S. Uh, the thing about the Japanese is that um, Japanese, uh, the Japanese practice in real estate acquisitions is quite different from that in the U.S. When uh, the Japanese buy uh, commercial buildings, uh, resort properties, uh, the contract they use is generally like two or three pages mm. uh, with very little detail, uh, just some language that says if there should be any dispute, we'll cooperate and resolve these disputes. Right. That would never work in the U.S. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, and so they came to Hawaii to buy these properties and we'll prepare these uh, purchase and sale agreements that are 60, 70 pages long, and they'll look at it and say, what the hell is this? Right. <laughs> and you'd have to explain it to them. Yes. And the uh, thing is, um, uh, the documents, uh, they, some of the more sophisticated people would have the documents translated either by uh, Japan attorneys or people, uh, translators in Japan, because there were very few translators in Hawaii available at the time, as I recall. Mm. Uh, so getting these 60, 70 page agreements in place was quite demanding, not to mention that the uh, deeds and assignment documents had to come along with that and there'd be several more documents like that. So when you sit at the closing table for people to sign documents, you have all these documents laid out on the table for uh, the president of the company to sign. Uh, and uh, they were quite stunned at what they were getting involved not, in. Not the custom in, no. in Japan, so you'd have to sort of walk them through it and explain yes. how, what, what to do. And the other thing is there would be no, uh, in Japan there are no escrows, uh, which is quite familiar for mm. Americans doing right. real estate transactions. Right. So we had to explain what an escrow is and 
how transactions were closed. Uh, because I understand in Japan, um, uh, if you're dealing with some of the smaller transactions, they would actually bring suitcases of cash on the table, exchange it with what they call the kendisho, which is uh, sort of equivalent to the deed, but uh, that evidences ownership of the property. Uh, so you exchange the money and the deed at the table, uh, which is something we would never do here as right, well. Right. So. So, so, so the bubble burst and uh, things went south. Is that right? And, it did. And, and investment stopped for a while. Or, or what, what, happened? what um, happened? When the bubble burst and the banks uh, were in trouble, uh, of course, they tried to resolve the issues themselves, but uh, it, it really wasn't possible. Uh, they didn't want to write off all of these loans that they made. Um, then the Japanese government got involved in the 90s after the bubble burst. They set up a government entity called the Resolution and Collection Corporation to assist uh, these banks in collecting these bad debts. Uh, the RCC, as we referred to them, would uh, take uh, these properties uh, under uh, their uh, wing and would get the parties together to resolve how uh, the bad debts, uh, if they could be collected, would be collected. Uh, of course, it wasn't possible to get a dollar for a dollar, so they tried to do their best. And um, that's when they started mortgaging the Hawaii and U.S. properties. Uh, and eventually, uh, the uh, U.S. properties would be sold off. So a lot of the people, the Japan companies that came in during the bubble, uh, ended up losing all of their properties and some of their properties in Japan, if not all. Uh, and a lot of the Japan properties would be reorganized and so forth. So it, it was a bad situation for all of the Japanese involved. And, and we only got a, about a couple minutes left What's the current status? What, what do things look like now for Japanese investment in, in, in Hawaii specifically? How, how are things going? Um, um, after the bubble burst, there was a period where there were very little in the way of investments from Japan. But things started uh, coming back again because the Japanese uh, continue to love Hawaii. So uh, they're looking at investments uh, in the 2000s again. But the Lehman shock uh, was another little bump along the way. Uh, but uh, e even after that, now uh, the Japanese are coming back and uh, I'm ke you know, keeping busy with uh, helping uh, newer investors, uh, the newer companies who are coming in, who uh, again feel that the uh, Japan is not big enough for them, so they need to go overseas. A lot have gone to China and Southeast Asia, but uh, a lot of them still feel the U.S., Hawaii is a safe place to invest. Well, Alan, I want to thank you, and I uh, want to invite you back sometime. We can talk about, about the future, sure, as, not just the past. Thank oh. you very much. Oh, you're welcome.